there is always a lot of bad, pub, bad publicity about Liverpool, and again, especially about Liverpool Eight. Um, again, with it being the oldest black community in Europe, it was always targeted. We never had any identity. Um, in, a, in a way, no one recognised us as being black Liverpoolians. You know, there was always a a very low level of respect for us, shall I put it that way. Um, and we were sort of all shoved into one area. When I was working in the 70s, just leading up in the 70s, uh, there was little or no opportunities for black people in the community, educationally, employment-wise. So, so we were suffering generational, generationally of um, lack of opportunity. And so you can only take so much coupled with there was a heavy police, there were heavy police problems. They could just do what they wanted. It was out of control and no one ever questioned them. The police um, um, behaviour was very much aimed at the youth. All black youth were regarded as, as something of a, a problem. It was really an uncomfortable time for us. And at the same time, there were things happening in different parts of the country which were kind of setting the mood or the atmosphere. We kind of, I suppose we kind of got used to living in um, an atmosphere where basically the police did what they want. In those times, everywhere you went, police presence was heavy and people were continually being stopped, searched, roughed up, sometimes planted with drugs, sometimes they got accused of going quick. And whenever we used to like move from one place to another after dark, we used to do it collectively as a group of kids. Um, simply because if anything happened to you in the hands of the police, you had a witness. There was people getting snatched off the streets, taken in the vans, uh, beaten up, thrown out somewhere. Um, the police were raiding people's houses and there was money or property taken. I mean, just, just general stuff like that and you were just wondering in the game where it was going. I was with the Met at the time and we were involved on a regular basis with issues and we, we I was chair of the Community Relations Council so I used to meet with the police, we used to meet with the police to raise concerns. We would say about the issues in relation to the police action on the streets, stopping young people, fitting them up. And, as, you know, and we said there's going to be problems. You knew something was in the air, but you didn't know what was in the air, if you get what I'm saying. You know what I mean? You know, there was little sporadic breakouts of little arguments with police and things like that, but I don't think anyone realised what was about to happen, to tell you the truth. There, there was a family in Liverpool who were constantly being harassed. I think everybody knows that that was the Cooper family. There was a man named Lester Cooper and he had four sons and on a, on a richly regular basis, you know, these guys would be walking the streets and they'd be constantly picked up. They'd be identified as belonging to the Cooper clan and they'd be constantly picked up and, 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 and put on false charges. My dad suffered a lot of <coughs> harassment in our like teenage years as a result of our behaviour, but equally how the police then took his approach to complaining against them and taking the numbers and just always being ready to document the harassment. Even the father himself ended up being harassed when he was making complaints that he felt his family were being harassed. Um, and basically the incident that led to the riots kicking off um, was one early evening when one of the brothers was stopped on a motorbike um, by police and he was being questioned and one thing led to another and they were trying to arrest him. And it was happening outside the community centre as well, but there was quite a few black people in attendance. I think it was Wally Brown who came out. He was waiting at that particular community centre and he came out at the time and he tried to pacify things, but things just got out of hand. One of the lads, Chris Brown, said to me, Wally, come down, there's problems down the back of the ground. So I went down there, there was four or five police vans. There's police everywhere and they had this guy, I'm not going to mention no name at this stage, but he's well known who it is, but he had him in the... In, 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 um, in the van. And so people started milling and shouting and, and beginning to sort of throw some little bricks at the, at the police. And in this situation, the guy got away. And there was an arrest made, ironically, I think it was the other brother who was arrested and not the brother who was on the motorbike. And, um, and that basically sparked, you know, a, a, a pretty bad situation. As he resisted, uh, more and more young black people came to his assistance and more and more police came into the area and that's be, and, they, and then they brought in the um, the riot vans. Part of the urban myth that has grown up around uh, the riots and the start of the riots was that I was the person on the bike, I was not the person on the bike. I turned up in the crowd, you know, people were shouting, you know, 
do your job properly, the bike's not stolen, what are you going on with? And at some point, they'd already taken the driver, uh, the rider <coughs> into the van. And somebody, again, it wasn't me, opened the van door and the rider jumped out and disappeared into the crowd. And as the police kind of made a move towards like trying to grab hold of them, that was the moment where the crowd and the police kind of physically met. And by the end of it, you know, three or four policemen were injured. I was being held on the floor and suddenly in the background they heard sirens, people disappeared. The next thing I know, I'm in the van and I'm being taken off to the local police station. I remember arriving about 10 or 20 of us uh, going into Parliament Street and it was, it was only fairly minor then, it was only just a few bricks getting thrown. We came back to um, the office to warn the staff that you know, we needed to be out there because, you know, the lads were getting agitated and the police were all coming in in vans um, and it was starting to look like as though the area was being closed off. It was clear that things weren't settled down on a Friday. Things were wrong, things were good, things were, well, there was, there was action on the streets. I went to the street police station to see the commander there to, to, to discuss what's going on, what they do, you know, because the police had these vans on the streets, which they didn't each have on the streets. So what we were saying to them was that the police need to get these vans off the street. So while we were talking to the, to, to the commander, um, the chief constable came in, Kenneth Oxford. Now, he must have been to a dinner somewhere because he had a dinner jacket on and he was all dressed up. And he comes in the room and he says, says to the, says to the, to the um, officer, what's the problem? Now, it turns out that the, because there were so many police, the reason was, and this is what he said, this is what the, what, what the the, the guy who spoke to, to Oxford, he said, it's the same problem, Chief, he said, um, the, there's been an over-reaction uh, to the call-out. So what happened? There'd been a call that there was somebody on a motorbike. But apparently, where that incident was, was in, was in the, the, the intersection of two police areas. So you get two, two responses from different areas. Plus, there's a traffic police also, back, you're not far from where Paddington School used to be. And they also reacted. So he got three reactions. That's why he had all these vans. So the police were admitting that they had a problem with communications. Um, and what we then said to him, look, you need to get the vans off the street because if you get the vans off the street, kids will go home. That'll be the end of it. If you leave the vans on the street, you'll be in trouble. A few friends of mine, and um, I'd heard about various people getting arrested and beaten by the police. So we'd come from a, a youth centre, which was the Methodist centre. And the next thing, um, a police uh, van pulled up and the uh, police jumped out all masked up. Imagine then the way he was dressed. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was frightening. It was like a futuristic and helmet and these long batons and they just started whacking out on us. I got it on the head, uh, knocked to the ground and a few of my friends got knocked to the ground and we quickly realised that we had to defend ourselves. So in that state of mind, uh, we were forced to defend ourselves and that's when the onslaught began. I was watching the evening news and suddenly they announced that there were riots in Toxford, Liverpool. I then saw images coming onto my TV screen. That's when it, it starkly became real and I couldn't quite um, understand what was actually happening. I kind of remember seeing the same day the fringes of little things happen. It, it sort of spread like wildfire throughout the community and people just basically snap. I can see bright, you know, like a bright glow like in the Parliament Street above the rooftops. And I was a bit confused, it was clearly a fire, uh, but I couldn't hear fire engines. Um, but as I was moving closer and closer, I could hear Voices getting louder and louder, and clearly it was a melee of some sort. There was some kind of trouble going on. And so I bypassed the friends once I entered the housing estate, and on the edge of the housing estate, separated from Parliament Street, there's an earth banking. And as I got closer and I started to mount the earth banking, I could just see the full drama of like a frontline situation. I just, I couldn't take in what was going on, and the first reaction was, I'm not too sure this should be going on. I thought this was like really heavy, you know, it was. This was our community. 
and there was this kind of like mad situation going on, the, the likes of which I've never seen before. On the sidelines, there were a number of community people running around, like what you have when a disaster's just happened. I remember there was a, pri a priest, there was a number of people from local community organisations, and there was a TV camera there, and people were running backwards and forwards, not really going anywhere, in a state of confusion. You could hear the noise from here, on Sapali. And that's why I said, I better get down there and see what's happening, you know what I mean? And they had, well, walking right on, you know what I mean? When the people who arrived and got tired, maybe two, three in the morning, went home. That's when the police started to, to do something, because now people are going home, no one's throwing any more bricks. The police now are trying to arrest people, and they're trying to arrest anybody and get their hands on it. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter who, because a lot of people are watching, you know, not ever. Less people, more people were watching them actually were, were, were throwing bricks. The next day we found that people were in, were in, were in, were in police stations all over Merseyside. You know, people who I knew, mild young women, being charged with rioting. So it was nonsense. So that made people more, more angry for the second night. It first broke out by the Caribbean Centre, on the corner by the Caribbean Centre, with Parliament Street and Moon Rake Street. At the time, there was some workmen had been doing some work in the area, so there was like a, a, a mobile. I always remember um, people milling around messing around, and they set this on fire. They set this mobile on fire. I remember saying, listen, you better, you better go, go because the police are going to be here, and they're going to be picking people up. When the police come, you couldn't, you couldn't do anything, because when they come, People by then started attacking the police, and then they started barricading the barricading the, um, the junction, stopping cars, hijacking cars, turning them over. It became obvious after a while that the, the police couldn't do anything. The police were powerless; they couldn't they couldn't stop anything. We weren't going to be running anywhere anymore, so to speak. <laughs> As well, this is it. You're right on our territory now, and uh, maybe a year or two ago, if if a jeep would have screeched up next to you, you would have been boom, you would have been driven away, but this wasn't happening, so people stood the ground and uh, that's basically how it started. People group together, people form allegiances and alliances and people have to have plans because it was ordinary people against the authorities. Right, uh, you know, if it's broken down, if, if law and order is broken down that much, then that's what it's caused for people to organise themselves. He seemed to be certain groups of um, people and individuals who were doing what they do, and I couldn't stop them. Nobody could stop them. That was their own free will of what they wanted to do. To me, it was like a spontaneous reaction to uh, pressures that had been. Uh, leveled against uh, not just uh, me individually, but thousands of people had been, you know, uh, subdued to some form of oppression, you know, in, in, in that regard. So the, the reaction was what happened. We fought against the police, but then the mob, like the mob does, it just goes out of control and it takes everything in its path. They had a car renting on Parliament Street, you know, like Van Rettel Company, and um, they'd gone in there and brought vans out and everything kind of been, you know, destroyed them, but they'd used them as part of barricades and then, you know, like police vans. And then times, they didn't even have proper riot vans, they were just vans, in it. Do you get what I'm saying? With all the windows smashed in and it was just mad. Buildings were ablaze, smoke, tyres, oil, everything was just um, unbelievable, really. Loads of police and they're getting it all a monkey chance and that. But I don't see them moving anyway, you know what I mean? See the kids lashing them with bricks, you know what I mean? And whatever they could get. And they, they was backing up and then they, some of them just threw the shields and got off, you know what I mean? These are the brave policemen, aren't they? They'd get paid danger money. You've got to imagine if you've got uh, a milk float on fire going at the police at 30 miles an hour. And going right into them. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a pretty horrific, uh, it's a pretty horrific scene. And uh, besides the bricks, the bottles, uh, the hatred, the atmosphere, uh, it, it was a violent situation, put it this way. 
he did not want to be getting caught by the police during that time. There's people who are driving him up from town, didn't know what was happening. All of a sudden they come down, especially down, down Grove Street, and they get hit with this barricade. And we were quickly turning around and get out of the way, frightened, you know. He was contained within uh, where the actual uh, fighting took place, which was the St. Nathaniel Estate and Upper Parliament. He was contained in the like, zone, a riot zone, and up, he had no way to move. So most people were trying to battle to get out of the situation, not battle to stay there. If anything, the, it was, the, it was the, the fault of the Merseyside police that this riot escalated because of their overreaction uh, to, the, to, to, the, to the situation that they actually then came with shields and armed up. So obviously you respond accordingly to that. I would say probably 80% of the people there, they had so much anger and it needed to be released. I mean, what, you know, it was the best to release it on the enemy as opposed to each other. People ran across the area, Liverpool Eight and beyond, were coming to sort of, I, 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 where I could see it, extract their own revenge on what they seen as the enemy. That's what it was clear. We, we was classed as an enemy in some regard, and um, that's the way it was seen in the, in the locality. Back then, it really was a matter of life and death. The idea that there was supposed to be a legal process going on, you know, to kind of like restrain, you know, a fired up community and restore, you know, peace and calm again, was like ridiculous. It was, it was really like a war situation. At one point, there was a road digger which was being used to go into the, to, 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 to break the front line and literally just strike and, 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 and harm as many police officers as possible. Um, it may sound like a really, a moral thing to say, but at the time, a lot of people didn't have any concern about what would be the consequences of something like that. I do have one image of um, a guy who was driving, I think it was a JCB, um, down up Parliament Street. He was just going up and down the pavements on this JCB with, with this pole sticking out the windscreen, and it, that was uh, so people were just. Um, it wasn't just aimed at the police because people all around were just diving out of the way. I remember what this night, I think, I'm not sure which night it was, but the police decided we're going to take control of this area before it starts. So what they did, the police evacuated all of Palmer Street. They, they cleared it. Remember, nobody's out at this stage. People just go out the business, there's nobody rioting. This is early, early, say six, five o'clock, six o'clock on the night. So they cleared the area and they set up barricades by the Charles Button Centre. The police set themselves up with human barricades by the Charles Button Centre, by the Rialto, by the intersections of, of, of Mulgrave and Grove, so people couldn't get into those areas. Right? So that's how it, that, that was that. So we were in the Charles Button we, and the, the police got outside us. They were set they were there, three or four deep, stopping people getting down. But of course nobody's out at that stage. Right about when people started riding, started coming out, when it started getting dark now, people come out. Of course, they started throwing the bricks and things. The police that were started at the Charles Button Centre were pushed right back to past the Alto. They, they was worried at them time about the racket club and still fighting them by the Charles Button, you know what I mean? And so when, when, when the, the rioters started to move, that's, that's, when, they, that's when they started. And they panicked, and they wanted, they wanted, yeah, they just wanted you not to go near that racket club. The front line was pushed right back down Parliament Street, very far and right up, very far up Parliament Street. I decided to go down with the Caribbean side, and a lot of guys ended up going up towards Lodge Lane. And subsequently, what happened from that was that Lodge Lane was razed to the ground and looted. Um, I stayed with the Caribbean centre half, and as we went down. Basically what happened as we headed down Parliament Street, we were making ground continually throughout the night and in the process, um, the Five Rackets Club was set ablaze and, 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 and looted. We got down as far as um, Catherine Street and Princess Road and the bank and the Rialto were set on fire exactly the same time. I didn't exactly see the start of the fire um, that, that brought the Rialto to the ground because I was too busy hanging around still outside of the Five Rackets Club. 
Well, I think they were deliberately targeted, and they were deliberately targeted because they were held in absolute contempt by the local community. I mean, the history of the Rialto going back to the 19... 30s and 40s, um, they had uh, they they used to operate a colour bar, um, and local black people couldn't use it, which is how Stanley House came into being, and that was set up um, for black people to have a community centre. Um, and then more more recently, um, in recent years, when Swainbank took the Rialto over as a second-hand um, furniture warehouse. And um, there was very well. There was no evidence of black people working there, even though they were located within the heart of the community. Um, the Rackets Club stood for um, really everything that the community um, abhorred: um, upper class people coming in to use the facilities of the community but giving nothing back. Yeah, they fought for that. You know what I mean? And once that's gone, that was it, and it must have hurt them. And then you bypass the hospital bar we so called trying to burn down, which wasn't true. And then there I also. And and like Dave says that they thought they fought there at the I also because they thought their their eyes was going into town. There was no intention of going into town. If they wanted to go into town, they'd have well gone. You know what I mean? And they said that but with the reason why we had, we had to fight so hard to stop them going into town, no intention of going into town. Because you knew if you got into town, you never got out. Everybody knows about the time when um, the home that had the old people in it was being emptied out. Um, there was kind of like, you know, um, uh, there was kind of like a, a bit of calm restored to, to allow um, the elderly people to be brought out of the home. It was the only time during the riots that we had a peace treaty. Uh, because what had happened is that obviously there was old women in the old women's home uh, and people had, had, had got in there etc so it was decided that we asked the police to cease fire for, for, for a bit. People stopped completely and let the ambulances in and everything to get the old people out of the old people's home. So that all went on while the 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 younger people held back the police. It just showed uh, our humanity uh, that there was it the, wasn't just uh, as the, as the uh, chief constable described us uh, a gang of black hooligans. It, 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 it was people you know, with black hooligans. I mean, nobody cares whether the 